I'm going to start now. And we're live. Scott, you're on mute. <laughs> Yes, I am. Great there start. Is. All right, cool. So welcome everybody to this uh, week's HLS Security Monthly. I'm once again joined by Tony Sims from his compound in an undisclosed location somewhere in the midst of Kentucky. Uh, he's going to be presenting to content today in, uh, you know, in relation to ransomware, all the various different outbreaks and things like that we've been seeing and how to combat, you know, these types of attacks really effectively with the Microsoft tooling. So Tony, uh, if you want to do a quick intro again and then uh, take her away. Yep, thanks Scott. So uh, happy to be here. My name is Tony Sims. I am a principal cybersecurity specialist. I work with Scott and uh, today we're going to look at how we can help protect against human operated uh, ransomware. So if I could just get uh, verification that is up on the screen. Is that Sharon? It is not yet. I am still seeing my slide. Oh, there we this. go. All right. No, I see it. All right. Good deal. So operator headspace and timing. So uh, again, we're going to talk about uh, defending against uh, human operated ransomware and got a lot of content so we're just going to roll through this pretty quickly so we can get to the demos and and hopefully get some questions so what brought us here well just like danger will robinson on um the 28th of october so a couple weeks ago uh there was an announcement by the fbi uh, homeland security uh the cybersecurity infrastructure security agency about a credible threat against healthcare organizations, specifically providers, uh, by one of the ransomware uh, operators out there. Uh, they issued an alert, which you can see the, the number here. Yeah, it's available for download. Uh, just search on that. And uh, that got everybody kind of spinning about ransomware again. And it was right before the election, like a, less than a week before the election. And on the 29th, Microsoft uh, did something that, that we have not done before, which is we proactively reached out to organizations uh, with some threat intelligence that we had. So this was really our threat analytics report on this particular ransomware campaign and uh, some indicators of compromise that, that were for that particular ransomware. So that's how we got here. And so we did some internal calls, Scott and I, and uh, there was an interest to potentially do something that was customer facing. So uh, so for you all uh, to, to understand how uh, you can use the Microsoft tool set to protect uh, against these types of attacks. So that's our purpose today is to, to look at this. And we're going to go through this using the uh, Ryuk TrickBot uh, ransomware as a model. And I know it's not the latest and greatest that we've already got a new one out there uh, but it'll give us an idea of how these human operated ransomware attacks occur uh, we're going to map it out to the miter uh, attack techniques and then we're going to break it down by individual uh, capabilities inside of the windows 10 endpoint as well as across microsoft defender and there were no systems harmed in the creation of this presentation uh, and just a note as we're going through uh, some of these demos because of the way the systems work together, if you sometimes have to defeat one system manually to be able to do a demo of another system. So a classic example is I have to disable Defender AV real-time protection to be able to show EDR. So when you see some of these attacks occur, you're probably gonna say to yourself, well, why didn't Defender AV stop that? Well, because I had to turn it off so that I could use the EDR tool. And we'll see that more as we go through this. <coughs> So let's look at this TrickBot kill chain. And uh, as we think about TrickBot and the majority of attacks out there today, they start with a phishing email. That's just the way they get in. They're gonna continue to fish us as long as we keep clicking on the messages. So they use that email to deploy some malware into the environment on that uh, initial device. They get the user to click it. There's lots of different ways they can do this uh, as far as making it look like a Windows update or make it look like a Teams update or whatever. Uh, they'll deploy then at this point, once they've got that initial foothold, so they've got an implant on the machine, 
this is where it becomes a hands-on keyboard attack. And this is why we call it human human operated ransomware versus uh, you know some of the ransomware in the past just deployed and was sort of like a atom bomb going off. It just blew out your whole network right away. Well, they're, they're a little bit smarter than that. So what they do is they have a hands-on keyboard component where they are doing reconnaissance, uh, they're escalating privileges, they're looking for sp specific data they might want to steal, uh, steal before they actually uh, detonate the ransomware. And then um, once they're, they've got that foothold using something like Cobalt Strike is a classic example of, of a tool they use, they're going to continue to reconnaissance Oh, Tony, you could, there? Yeah, could be missed me, but I don't hear Did, him now. There okay, he is. I'm, I'm back. You're, you're back. All right. Yeah, that was a little strange. Okay. So uh, anyway, so they'll use Bloodhound to discover systems, and then they'll uh, use lateral movement tools like PS Exec or attack frameworks to move on to other systems, and then uh, they will uh, tamper with the AV systems in the environment to be able to get the ransomware in place and uh, detonate that payload. So uh, this is how uh, these attacks typically occur. Now let's map these out to MITRE. And one thing I love about MITRE, the MITRE attack framework, is it it is like a common language for security professionals. So now when we're talking about an attack technique or a component of an attack, we can immediately determine what we're all talking about. So it's no more the attacker got on the machine using you know, magic pixie fairy dust onto the machine because there is no such thing, right? So now we have to define as professionals, how did they get on? Well, they used PowerShell and then they did credential dumping. So I really like that common uh, language and it, and it makes it very clear when we're trying to explain how defensive techniques work uh, against a particular attack. Oh. One other thing, just before I forget, down at the bottom, uh, this attack could occur in less than 24 hours. So it, it can be very rapid if they want to uh, complete this, this attack. So when we think about this, uh, you know, uh, I'm an old military guy, and a long time ago, when I was a field artillery officer, I always have to have a military story in here. Uh, we talked about defense in depth, and we talk about defense in depth and cybersecurity as well. And one of my instructors, I remember saying that when you do a defense in depth, really all you're doing is trading space for time. So I, I, I'm going against the enemy that maybe is stronger than me. So I'm going to try to use space to my advantage. And, and what that kind of looks like. So you're going to see some really awesome artwork that I did here. So uh, this might be a battlefield out there. And then we've got some scouts out there. and We've got an engagement area and some fighting positions and and everything and Mike's getting real excited here and then uh, we might have some fallback positions that we can go to and then back here we might have our final defensive line well it's no different in your network so when we think about inside your network uh, you've got the PC systems that the users use that are really the front line uh, we call that tier two in Microsoft speak so that's your your front facing devices then you've got your tier one devices and these are servers uh, maybe more important workstations. They serve functions, databases. And then you got tier zero. And tier zero is really when we start thinking about the crown jewels. So that's your domain controllers. Uh, that might be your, your company database. Uh, that's tier zero. And unfortunately, and this is something I think a lot of organizations don't understand, is you're probably going to lose a couple of tier two machines no matter what. And, and that's okay. Because remember, we're all about buying time with space. And so if we can detect and respond on those tier two systems quick enough, we can keep the adversary from getting to tier one and tier zero. So just something to keep in mind as you're planning out your defense. No defense is perfect. No tools are perfect. Not even Microsoft's tools, I know, heaven forbid. Uh, so we have to think about this as, as a uh, layered defense. So what can we do uh, to better protect ourselves? Well, there's some really common 
lessons learned that our detection and response team has uh, talked has talked to customers about, and our CISO has talked about. And it's really, if you think about a stool and a stool having three legs, the first thing you need to do is think about protecting your identity. When we look at attacks today, they're identity focused. They're not crashing firewalls, going through firewalls. All they're doing is stealing identity, gaining access with those credentials. We have to stop allowing them to have that identity. So that could be multi-factor authentication to prevent them from accessing uh, and then breaking lateral movement paths. We're going to talk about that uh, more as we go through this, but essentially keeping them from the adversary from going from one system to the next. Because what our uh, DART team has learned is that once these folks get in your environment because of these lateral movement paths, that's how they can move through the environment in less than 24 hours. So you got to break those lateral movement paths. Ensure device health. I know we hate it. Uh, we've hated it since the day it began, but you got to patch. You got to patch and you got to ensure your configuration is compliant to your standards. Uh, that can be a challenge in a large network and it can be a challenge with uh, how fast some of the patches come out. Focus on what's important first. So when we think about protecting our network, you want to protect tier two because uh, that's your front line. And, and those folks need to be the most protected because that's how the bad guys are getting into the environment. And then focus on tier zero because if they compromise tier zero, then they basically own your whole network. And then the tier one machines will kind of work themselves out if, if we can do the proper defense across uh, tier two and tier zero. And they don't necessarily touch every system. They only touch systems that they have to to accomplish their mission. Uh, so, so we have to, as defenders, we have to identify what the important systems are. And that even flows into data. So if you don't know where your data is and what your data is, how can you protect it? And so I hear a lot of questions about, um, you know, data protection and digital rights management, and DLP. Uh, those are all tools that can help you get control of your data because you have to be able to protect that data. And that even goes into backing up and having multiple copies of backups and offsite backups because these adversaries, again, are going to destroy backups if they can find them. They're going to destroy shadow copies if they can find them. So if you don't remember anything else out of this session, remember these three pillars because they will, if you follow these three pillars, they will lead you to the right te technical controls. Hey, hey so, Tony. Uh, this is Scott. I, I got one one thing to throw in there as well, is that we also have a, a site where we've published, uh, you know, a bunch of the mitigations that you, you know, can proactively put in your environment to focus on securing those, you know, the keys to the kingdom type credentials, your domain controllers, things like that, and also breaking lateral account movement. Movement. Um, it's it's the securing privileged access roadmap. Um, so if customers haven't you know, taken the time to take a peek at that, regardless of what technology you're talking about, um, those are still the key things you need to focus on um, in order to make sure that you're breaking that standard attack playbook. Yep, yep. And, and, and it really, a lot of this hasn't changed. Everybody got really excited about this ransomware threat. And I remember telling my boss, it's like, OK, it's just another day. It's another day on the cyber battlefield. You know, do do the same things you need to do to protect yourself, identity patch and, and protect data. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's start getting into control measures. Um, so the and I'm kind of working my way back. So I'm starting at tier two and I'm starting about uh, looking at uh, capabilities that are on Windows 10 first and then we'll move into the higher end stuff. I think everybody always we love the shiny new toys and we love the really exciting uh, security tools. But honestly, some of the blocking and tackling stuff can really, really help. So as we think about Defender Antivirus, and I don't think people give Defender as much respect uh, as it, it should have. It's incredibly powerful. It is a cloud connected um, behavioral anti-malware system. So it's not just a signature based static you know, update the signature and it works for a week and until the new signatures come out or whatever. This thing is constantly being updated. And so it provides near instant detection. And I will tell you, as I was going through the demos in, in here, I struggled until I would uh, stop Defender. There's a lot of things that I thought would get through with maybe some of the Defender components turned off and I'd turn the whole thing off. So uh, just just really take a look at Defender and, and how it can be used. It, uh, 
is updated, like I said, in real time. It does have sandboxing capabilities, so it can uh, send data off uh, for analysis if it can't make a determination locally. Uh, so you have to have that cloud uh, deliver protection on. There's a tamper protection functionality built into it. Make sure you turn that on. So the tamper protection is going to get uh, give you protection against somebody coming in and disabling the AV uh, or killing the process. So you definitely want to enable that. Uh, and if possible, if you have a device management tool like Microsoft Endpoint Manager or Intune, uh, make sure that you're setting this centrally and you have your standards set across the board. So on all these slides, I tried to add the uh, techniques from MITRE that they would protect against. And so you can see the MITRE techniques here. Uh, just for this slide, I'll talk a little bit more about them. So when we think about spear phishing, that's dropping an attachment down. Defender will see that as an attachment is saved. It will uh, detect and can't stop that as it's saved. User execution, it can stop. Uh, even though a user clicks on something, it could stop it in process. Uh, PowerShell, we're going to talk more about how we protect against PowerShell uh, in the next slide. Uh, service stop, you know, if I've got a piece of malware that stops or kills the service, I can protect against that. And then uh, most importantly, stopping the ransomware uh, payload itself where it encrypts the files. Uh, so Defender AV is a, is a very critical component across our platform. So the next uh, component that I don't think a lot of people know about is anti-malware script interface. And it's just built into Windows 10. It's something that uh, you don't ever hear, uh, hear us talk a ton about. Uh, but this allows us to inline analyze fileless attacks. So if I drop a piece of PowerShell onto your machine or I run a piece, execute a piece of PowerShell code, uh, this anti-malware script interface will run it, analyze it, send the results to Defender, and then Defender can actually block it. So super powerful capability, and we'll show some demos of that. And we released uh, fairly recently uh, the AMC for Visual Basic for applications. So a lot of these attacks are still using good old macro attacks. I can remember cleaning macro attacks off in like 1997. So we're still having that challenge, and uh, AMC can detect and analyze those macro attacks uh, it just as well as it can PowerShell VB script and JavaScript. So let's jump into a demo. So um, this I recorded these demos just for the, the sake of time. So what I'm doing now is I am um, deploying code that's going to launch an implant on this machine. So when I did that, uh, what you'll notice is it was blocked by my antivirus software because I have uh, Defender enabled on the machine. Obviously, it's leveraging AMSI. So let's take a look by going into the event log. And if you're not familiar where the event log for Defender is, because a lot of people are, it's uh, very intuitively layered about four levels down inside of the uh, event viewer. So you got to go into Microsoft Windows and scroll way down here to the bottom. And find Defender and select operational. And so now we can see our event log and if we drill into this particular event, we can see that we stopped that we detected that as a Trojan and uh, you can see where the detection source was AMSI. So AMSI ran that script, analyzed it, reported back to Defender. Defender took the results, compared it to its intelligence and stopped it. So very simple demo. Uh, but it shows the power of that, even against a fileless attack, which a lot of AVs don't see because it never touches disk. Quick, quick question there. Um, sure. So for the operational log for Defender, I know a lot of those ops logs hidden down there have to be enabled. Does that one have to be turned on, or is that one on out of the box? No, that one's on out of the box. So as, oh. soon as, you, as long as you've got Defender enabled, you'll start getting uh, the events in there. Um, the that leads into this next section, which is uh, I, sh I, I forgot to put on here. If you use what we call attack surface reduction rules, which is another set of protections. So think of these as exploit. They're basically part of our exploit protection on the endpoint. So a lot of people talk about host intrusion detection systems and prevent protection systems or HIDs or HIPs. Um, Attack surface reduction falls into that category. They're against very specific types of, of attacks. So you'll notice that uh, things like Office uh, executing code 
uh, and injecting into other processes. There's just nothing right about that. We Word is no business injecting into another process and starting a connection to a C2 network. And so we can enable these attack surface reduction rules to give us an additional layer of protection outside of what Defender uh, provides. Now, the great thing about these is they do uh, have an audit mode because you can imagine that there are, is some potential for application compatibility. Uh, so you can turn these in on audit mode first and then try them out, make sure you're not going to disrupt any of your applications. And where do you find the data that comes back from these? In the event log that we just looked at. So they will also show up uh, in the same Defender uh, event log. So let's take a look at a, at a quick demo. So the first thing I want to highlight in this demo is uh, demo.wd.microsoft.com. Uh, this is the Defender, used to call it the Defender Sandbox or Defender Playground. Uh, if you want to test out Defender and some of the different capabilities, this is a great way to do it. It's all uh, non-malicious, but it has behavioral indicators that, that make it get detected. And so if you go into attack surface reduction, uh, you've got some scripts that will enable attack surface reduction. So uh, easiest way to enable these is via PowerShell. Uh, so I can enable these on a system and then I've got some test files that I can run. So in this case, um, I'm gonna go ahead and run the script that's gonna turn it into block modes. So I'll execute that particular script and here's where it's writing this out. And those scripts are available for download. You don't have to write that yourself, uh, which is good for me. Uh, and then what we're gonna do next uh, is we're going to make sure that Defender is ready uh, to protect because Defender does have to be enabled and real-time protection and cloud delivery protection have to be on. So this does have to be your primary AV uh, for this to work. Now we can also put exclusions in. So in a lot of my demos, you'll see stuff going to the tools with a Z, really cool uh, lead speak uh, location. Uh, that's just so that I can get past some of the protection mechanisms. So I'm running a, a VB script. Uh, that's going to trigger attack surface reduction. So it would have tried to start Notepad, but we had ASR enabled, so it blocked it. You can see the pop up. And then as we go into the event log, we can see the event ID 1121, which is the ASR uh, block event. And there's an event for audit too. So if you, if you put it in audit mode. So that's ASR. It's the most effective security tool that nobody knows about and nobody uses. So go out there, turn on uh, attack surface reduction. It can it can really help protect your environment. Another capability built into Windows 10 is something called controlled folder access. So we're still focusing on those tier two machines. We're still focusing on that front line of, of individuals out there. So controlled folder access is where we can protect our data directories or really any directory on the machine from being accessed by untrusted applications. So uh, essentially you tell it what you want to protect and what you want to protect against, or excuse me, I should say what you want to allow to access, not, not the protect against. And then uh, we enable that in the platform and with Defender as the real-time protection engine, then we will protect from say ransomware getting in there and encrypting. So let's take a quick look at this. And oh, by the way, this has a bonus demo of Defender Smart Screen. So I want you to, Defender Smart Screen is built into uh, the Edge browsers and it will try to stop you from shooting yourself in the foot. So it'll try to keep you from deploying malware into your environment or executing malware. I want you to really notice how many times I have to actually bypass it. So we're back on our, um, demo site we go to control folder access we can see it's pretty simple to enable uh, if you haven't started using the set mp preference and the get mp preference powershell command line, uh, it's definitely a good thing to to use makes it easier to play with these features i'm going to copy that one so i don't have to do as much typing so i'll go into powershell first thing i want to do is enable control folder access so we'll just run that command real quick and there's a lot of settings in here in the PowerShell that you don't see in the interface, so, so definitely check that out. So we're going to protect the demo directory. So now we're going to download our ransomware. So you'll notice it blocked it because it said this could harm your device. So I'm going to go up here and say keep. Then it comes up again and says, hey, Tony, you're stupid. 
don't download this. This is ransomware. And we said, no, I, I really want to keep that. So uh, now I have bypassed security multiple times to get this onto the machine. OK, so I've told it that this is OK and I've, I've allowed it to come in. There's our demo directory. It's unencrypted. Now we're going to execute this. Now remember, we have controlled folder access enabled. Oh, by the way, you can't run it because we're protecting you. Yeah, go ahead, run it anyway. So now uh, you'll notice nothing happened. Well, the reason nothing happened was because controlled folder access blocked the ransomware from executing. Uh, so worked really well, even though I bypassed security like four times to allow that thing to, to execute. So now we're going to disable controlled folder access. Now let's run it again. And that was quick. And so it has now encrypted. It sends me a little message saying, hey, I've got your files and you have to pay me bitcoins. And you can see that it encrypted the files in the demo directory. So this is very selective. Uh, it's obviously not really malicious, but it simulates effectively what ransomware does. So go ahead, Scott. Yeah, quick question for you. Uh, we we had one posted here, and I, I thought it'd be worth talking about. Uh, so our ASR ASR rules, um, if you have them in audit mode or even just flat and block mode, uh, you know we get the events in the event viewer. Do we also additionally see those events in the ATP console? Uh, you know the EDR. Do do they auto get collected there, or do we have to configure a different mechanism for uh, snagging all of those events? No, that's a great question. No, they do go to Defender, uh, Defender for Endpoint or what used to be Defender or ATP. Yeah, they absolutely f surface up. And that's really that's really the control mechanism for this is Defender for Endpoints. Although you can, you, as you saw, I can use PowerShell to do a lot of this work as well. But but really the enterprise level console for all this is Defender for Endpoints. So yeah, it, it absolutely goes there. Great question. All right, let's talk about uh, network protection. So network protect, we saw smart screen. So smart screen does a lot more than just protect against connections. And we saw that it does file reputation, it'll stop downloads, whatever. But what if I'm using a different browser and I want to restrict connections to known malicious sites? That's where network protection comes in. So essentially it provides smart screen like functionality to other browsers. It's also leveraged by uh, Defender for Endpoints and Cloud App Security to protect against unsanctioned cloud apps. So let's say I want to restrict somebody from getting to, uh, I don't know, box.com. I'm not picking on box, but just one that came to mind. I can actually go in and make that unsanctioned. It'll send over the appropriate indicators to Defender uh, for endpoint, which will then use network protection to stop it. And then we can also use this uh, for web content filtering uh, as well. Does require that uh, Defender AV is in real time protection mode as well as uh, cloud delivered protection uh, enabled. Windows Firewall. This is another unsung hero of the Windows platform. Um, people don't give this thing enough credit. It is a full-fledged firewall and it will do uh, capturing a drop packets if you want it. That's the number one question I get about Windows firewalls. Can I see what you're dropping? Uh, if you enable it, you have to enable it, uh, then yes, you can. So you've got a firewall here that you can leverage. Now, the question at the top of the screen is super important. Do your workstations need to talk to other workstations? Most cases, probably not. So you don't need, you know, client one and client two talking to each other because their ability to communicate, especially over something like SMB, is a lateral movement path. And that's what we see a lot of these um, ransomware families use is that lateral communication between workstations. So you really need to think about how do I allow my systems to communicate and who needs to communicate with who uh, beyond what you do with your network uh, devices. Yeah, just to add a little color here too, because I, I I love Windows Firewall. Um, I know it it for you know it doesn't have the best brand out there in the market, but at the end of the day, um, it came out in like two. I think it came out with Windows 2003 XP, kind of that time frame, 
and there there was a bug right like right away but that's been it so it's kind of still suffering from brand or reputation issues now for 17 years um and i i highly recommend everybody kind of give it a um another another test run because it's it's built right in it's amazing um it's got application awareness and everything i mean it's very powerful well and then i you know i forgot to mention the blinding flash the obvious don't turn it off right it, i i mean i i have been involved with an organization that was under attack and they were tr troubleshooting and i asked the question do you have the windows firewall disabled and they were like yes and i'm like why <laughs> so so they were actually you know open the in it wow. there's no reason to turn it off like like scott said the thing is application aware um it, it it'll handle the the communications from applications appropriately so so definitely take advantage of that tool don't just i think back in the day and this maybe get to your your point scott there were applications that would get, would get you know disrupted by that firewall being enabled but i haven't seen that in the windows 10 days at all no and, and the killer for me is when i talk to a customer and they have the windows firewall on but they've disabled it for the domain profile right D don't 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 do that that, that's yeah, that's that, the profile you need to have it on for. Right, because uh, those profiles, uh, we could probably do a whole session on this. Those profiles yeah, yeah. are actually defined appropriately to allow the communication that needs to occur. Um, you know, so anyway, yeah, don't don't disable it. Uh, I did not go into Credential Guard uh, for this demo. Credential Guard is built into to Windows 10 as well in, in the later server OSs, and it does protect against uh, credential harvesting and dumping off of a machine. Now, there's some specific hardware requirements there around virtualized security that I just didn't have the bandwidth to get running in, in Azure, so, so I didn't do that. But just understand that's another layer of protection that, that we're not even going to discuss uh, that's, that's available in the operating system. All right, let's uh, watch my time here. So let's talk about finding blind spots uh, in dead space. So um, dead space is a term that we use a lot in the military. It's essentially if you think about uh, between two hills, if I'm looking from one hill to the next, the area in between I may not be able to see, that's dead space. And, and there are certain areas on the network uh, that I've traditionally not seen covered by tool sets or sensors. And so we want to be able to cover those, uh, those areas of dead space. So the first uh, component we're going to look at. So now we're moving away from the built-in Windows 10 tools and we're getting into the more advanced uh, Microsoft 365 Defender tools. So the first one we're going to look at is Defender for Endpoint, uh, formerly known as Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. We had a recent name change. Uh, we're only looking at the EDR component here. There's a whole bunch of capabilities in this platform we're specifically just looking at, at edr on this uh, session so when we think about uh, the edr it's looking for process level activity so the way i think about it is defender av is going to catch any file based stuff it actually catches a whole lot more than that but let's just be simple and say it's going to catch my file based stuff when i start getting into the fileless attack techniques process injections um, that, that don't ever touch disk, I need to be able to look at processes, memories, uh, or excuse me, memories, processes, memory, uh, the kernel, login activities, user behavior, all those things I need to be able to use to look for indicators beyond just something touching disk. And that's where an EDR becomes really interesting. Uh, in, in I know some organizations will leverage Sysmon, uh, which is a great tool beyond the scope of this presentation it's in sys internals but with that tool you got to ingest it somewhere and then you got to dig through it and find what's important the edr is going to surface that for you one thing i just highlighted on here is you'll notice that we have integrated miter across this whole platform so as we're looking at how to protect against uh these different techniques inside of the defender platform you'll actually see uh the uh the miter technique that was used uh that we blocked Inside of Defender uh, for endpoints is also automated instant uh, um, and response or errors. And errors 
it's not SOAR, so we always hear the term uh, security orchestration, automation, and, and remediation or response. This is more about self-healing. So let's say we, in the case on the screen, you see there's a remote WMI uh, execution uh, that occurred. And uh, we, that's not something that would have touched disk. So how do we, how do we remediate that? So we do that with errors and that's leveraging the Defender uh, Sense agent that's built into Windows 10 uh, that allows us to go in there and stop some of these in-memory type attacks. It's going to operate neither auto or semi-auto mode and essentially auto means it's going to automatically remediate the issue. Semi-auto is going to wait for operator intervention uh, before it remediates and this is important especially you know Scott and I both work in healthcare and if we think about you know hospital devices I don't necessarily need to be you know killing processes and rebooting nursing workstations and things like that so maybe I want to um, I want to put that in semi-auto mode and then uh, this can also trigger additional investigations across other components inside of Defender uh, Defender um, the stack so in the identity and in an office and uh, it will repeat based on the alerts it sees. Now one thing that you'll notice on here uh, is sometimes or if you notice errors you'll see where it doesn't necessarily find anything and you'll say wait a second it saw a threat but then it never found the threat. What happens with errors in a lot of cases is we'll detect will trigger an investigation while airs is spinning up defender av will automatically remediate the threat locally and by the time airs finishes its investigation it's gone already so that so if you ever see some of the these uh, investigations that don't complete uh, a lot of times that's what happened is that uh, the the other tools actually uh, fixed it before airs was able to in, engage so let's uh, go ahead and uh, this is an actual macro attack. I spent most of uh, yesterday building this out. So this is for real. I'm using uh, Covenant uh, as, as the attack framework here. So I've built a little macro that we're going to execute. and It's going to deploy what's called a grunt, which is a, uh, an implant used by Covenant. So we're going to trigger, trigger it off of Evil Vlad's resume. And again, got to keep enabling it. Oh. Oh, that that's just an error. No big deal there. So, so let's go back and oh, wait a second. Maybe it wasn't just an error. Maybe it was actually. Oh yeah. So we just deployed an implant on our machine because users never do that. So anyway, um, so we deployed uh, that particular implant onto that machine just like an attacker would. Um, so so they now have a foothold in the network. Once they get a foothold in the network, now they're going to start following that kill chain. So uh, let's go in and start looking in Defender for endpoints at what's happening on the system. So here's the system that we deployed it to. And you're going to see, and I've been doing a lot of demos, so I have to filter this down just to show you the new ones. And so here is everything that we detected. You'll notice that there's an automated investigation that's running uh, on the system. Uh, that was for that uh, execution of that macro and we can see that it was all started by suspicious behavior by word so we'll drill into that and you'll notice there's our miter technique so uh, exploitation for client execution it uh, came from edge because we downloaded the particular file and we can scroll down and you'll notice we downloaded evil vlad's resume and then when we kicked off evil vlad's resume what we see is it came from that website, so we could actually see where I downloaded it from. I didn't have time to set up a domain uh, to make it look really cool, but uh, anyway, so we deployed the malware, which executed some PowerShell, which which was then uh, caught by the system. Uh, so if we go back and look at the alert queue, uh, you can see that uh, we see a couple of, of suspicious command lines uh, that were executed as part of this as well, and we can continue to drill into these. And you notice that's hasn't been filtered, so you see a lot of things going on. Let's go look at this automated investigation. So if we we drill into uh, the investigation for the obfuse malware, we can see that uh, it infected one device. Uh, here's the alert that triggered it. There's our device. What evidence did we find? 
So we found uh, that particular document. So Evil Vlad's resume. Here are uh, the different components of evidence that uh, we gathered through this automated investigation. And then here's what the investigation did. So the log is actually telling you what the investigation uh, conducted. So when we think about errors, think about it as almost like a tier one analyst or a tier zero analyst. So it's going to help with alert overload because it's going to go through and handle a lot of that, that uh, pre-analysis or gathering of data so that the analyst doesn't have to do that kind of grunt work uh, to be able to, to pull that data back. So it can really, really save you a lot of time. And that works in other parts of Defender as well. We're just focusing right now on, on the EDR component. Now, I didn't demo this. This is uh, what we call behavioral blocking and containment. It's relatively new, so a few months uh, ago it released. It's essentially EDR block mode. So EDR is normally a, a telemetry and then detection engine. It's not doing actual blocking in, in a lot of cases. Um, it's just the way that EDRs are made. So what we did though, is we've enhanced the, the ability for our EDR leveraging Defender AV, but it doesn't have to be the active AV. This is key, right? So a lot of times I'll tell you, Defender AV has to be active. In this case, it can be, be in what's called passive mode. And so if let's say I decide to load a third-party antivirus on a Windows 10 system, Defender will see that and go into passive mode. You don't have to uninstall it, it just goes into passive mode. If I'm using uh, Defender for Endpoint with the uh, EDR and block mode, if something gets by the third party antivirus, it will actually uh, get, let's say that it gets detected by the EDR and then the EDR in block mode will stop it. So it gives you another component of a defense in depth uh, and it, it helps, especially when we start thinking about some of these fileless attacks that maybe, uh, you know, AV just doesn't always do a great job of, of detecting. So uh, I haven't turned it on because it makes it miserable for me to try to do demos if EDR is blocking everything on top of Defender blocking everything. So I, I haven't enabled it in, the, in my environment. So the attack is continuing. Uh, the attacker is now going to start doing some more reconnaissance and try to gain uh, access to multiple systems. So let's take a look at this. And so we can see right now there's a lot of different things happening. Now the first thing we do is we go into the alert queue. And when we think about the alert queue, and let me pause for just a second on that. This is the way most uh, tools work and the way most analysts attack the problem, right? They go into the alert queue. How overwhelming is that? I mean, that's a lot of alerts that, that and we've done some consolidation here, but that's a lot of alerts. So that, can, that leads to what's called alert overload. And how do I decide which one of these is important and which one do I start working with first? Do I start at the first one and go to the end or do I start at the end and go backwards? How do I do that? So just keep that in mind as we're looking at the alerts. So I've gone out of the alert queue. Now maybe I, I said, you know what? Let's go look at devices. And I can see this is domain controller and it's tagged as a high value device. So maybe I should start there. So now I go into the alert queue on the domain controller. Oh. I go into alert queue on the domain controller. I've still got like, you know, 12, 15 new alerts in here I got to deal with. Um, so, so maybe not the most effective way to do this. I can also jump to the timeline, by the way, if I want to look at any processes uh, in network level activity, I can do it through the timeline. But we've got something inside Defender uh, across the board called incidents. And incidents is where we basically do a correlation and create a high fidelity incident out of multiple alerts. So if I look at this one particular incident, it has consolidated and correlated 31 separate alerts. So as an analyst, if I resolve that one incident, guess what, I cleared 31 alerts. So if we drill into this uh, particular incident and we can start seeing how all of this is related, and this is gonna get even better here in a minute, uh, so I can see that it involves three different machines. I can see that Ayers is already doing some investigation for different activities uh, out there. So uh, horizontal port scan uh, as an example. So when the attacker got in, they ran a port scan and we detected the port scan. Now you notice that no threats were found. Why is that? 
by the time errors got there, the port scan was over. It was injected into memory and then it was done. So it saw the port scan and investigated, but it didn't uh, stop it. Now, if we look at this graph and we've got uh, this is kind of a work in progress, we can see that different machines have uh, been compromised, but they've all been compromised by PowerShell. And we notice that some of these machines have connections to uh, potentially suspicious network communication. So if we click on this particular one and we start drilling into it, now it's been seen twice in the last 30 days in my organization. And if I click on it, I can get some data back. Now I will tell you that's GitHub. And that's where I downloaded from GitHub. So it was picked up as misuse of a of a legitimate website. And so that's that's why it got added. And that's where I ran an atomic red team from GitHub. And that's my execution log that was dropped on the machine as part of that. So we'll go back and we'll take a look at the alerts again. Maybe drill into a couple of these uh, other alerts. Here's a good one. Suspicious credentials dump from ntds.dit. So somebody's trying to steal your whole uh, domain controller database. And uh, what we see is that it was a, a WMI command that was run uh, from my implant on the domain controller, uh, trying to basically steal the ntds.dit file. Now, let's go back and investigate on the domain controller because I'm going to set up for the next demo. So I'm going to go back to the device page. And over here on the left, you'll notice it says MDI to alerts. That's Microsoft Defender for Identity. That's going to become important uh, as we move forward because everything we've looked at so far has been strictly around the endpoint detection and response. Now, before we move on, uh, Scott and I have had a running conversation after this this whole ransomware um, emergency that occurred about the value of indicators of compromise, and they're definitely valuable. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that IOCs are not valuable. The problem is they're perishable. And um, what do I mean by perishable is it's really easy for an attacker to change things like file hashes, network locations, and domains. Uh, and I didn't do anything. This is just the way Covenant works. You'll notice that I have two of the Covenant implants that are, that are uh, displayed on the screen. They have different hashes. They didn't show up in virus total, and they've only been seen once worldwide because they're unique. So if I was to share that file hash, it's not super useful. Uh, to anybody outside there, and it's super easy for me to change it. So, uh, Scott, I don't know if you want to add anything about about this. Yeah, yeah. To me, the, the the big thing here is whenever you're looking at this perishable threat intel, like Tony said, the specific indicators themselves don't necessarily provide a ton of value. Uh, you know, in fact, a lot of a lot of times, if you have a file hash or a specific IP or something like that. You know, you know, the bad guys have access to the same threat intel as everybody else. Once they know they're identified, they'll definitely, you know, morph the, the file just enough to change the hash, which is absolutely nothing of a change, um, or move to, you know, new IPs or, or whatever, because they, they know that those resources get burned, but a lot of times they have, you know, just massive networks. So this is where looking at the threat intel from the perspective of what these particular attackers are doing and mapping that back to the MITRE techniques, you can use that mapping then to understand what the active threats are out there in the environment. And then you can go back to your people, your tooling, your procedures, and make sure that you have the protections and controls in place and the visibility to make sure that you're seeing these attack categories. You know, is it a PowerShell attack? Is it T1087 or whatever, right? You can tr use that framework to attack where you are. You can use that framework for you to attack uh, where you potentially have blind spots or where you need to additionally ramp. Uh, so it's very powerful from that perspective. It's really helping you get ready, uh, you know, if you're looking at it more categorically as opposed to a specific indicator. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, there's a great white paper that that I should have put a link to. I forgot. Uh, maybe we can post it. Uh, this guy wrote a paper a long time ago about he calls it the pyramid of pain. And it essentially it talked about how hard it is for an attacker to change IOCs. Um, these are easy. File hashes are easy. What's not easy is a TTP, a tactic, technique, and procedure. And that's why you see tools like EDR tools and Defender 
uh, detect it's a TTP and behavioral level, because if we can burn that, that's hard for them to change, right? If I got to go back and retrain my whole uh, team uh, to attack you differently, that's highly expensive for me. So anyway, beating that horse pretty good. Um, Let's talk about lateral movement. Uh, so if you if you see this screenshot and you've never seen this before, uh, this is a tool called Cobalt Strike. It, it is a, um, a penetration testing tool, but it's also used by a lot of bad guys. I've been fortunate enough to use it a couple of times myself in some red team exercises. Very, very cool platform. Uh, makes it super easy. It makes you look like a, a real hacker, even though all you're doing is kind of clicking on things. So um, when we think about disrupting lateral movement, one of the most important things you can do is make sure you've got different uh, local admin passwords. So LAPS is a free tool from Microsoft. Doesn't cost anything. You can download it at the link listed there. This is going to allow you to rotate your local admin password. If you run a tool like Bloodhound and your lateral movement path looks like a star, which basically means if I compromise one account, I can get everybody in the domain. That's not good. You want to make that as hard as possible. So LAPS is a great tool. Um, ways that we can disrupt lateral movement is to prevent credential harvesting. You've already seen all the tools that do this. So here's an example of a Mimi Cats that was stopped. Uh, you know, they're always making new versions of that tool, and there's attackers that build custom versions. But the behaviors, like Scott said, are very common, right? So we see those behavioral indicators and we can actually stop those. There's a, actually an ASR rule that'll stop credential dumping. Now, the, the tool for detecting lateral movement attacks is Microsoft Defender for Identity, it used to be known as Azure Advanced Threat Protection. Uh, I actually really like this name change because it is more accurate in what it does and i like to call it an intrusion detection system for active directory and and so it's going to detect things like reconnaissance pass the hash attack curb roasting those types of, of occurrences uh, it's going to work in conjunction with the other defender platforms it's built into integrated with cloud app security and if you're using cloud app security and Azure AD Identity Protection along with Defender uh, Identity, you'll get a 360 view of what somebody's doing with their identity. All right, let's take these Legos and put it together. We're getting close on time. So there's the final demo uh, that I wanted to show. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna show you how it works across the stack and we're actually gonna remediate it. I think we got just about enough time. So now we've gone to the 360, Microsoft 365 Defender Portal, which is security.microsoft.com. And we've got incidents in here, except these incidents inside of this portal include more than just EDR. So you'll notice up here, this particular incident has 36 alerts involved and it has identity in 365 Defender itself. So some of the AI that's part of this. Uh, so we continue to uh, enhance that uh, detection using 365 Defender. Now we can see that uh, we've mapped this out to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, so it looks pretty close to the actual attack method. I didn't have an initial access, but you can see uh, that we've got the different categories represented here. We get a nice little storyline uh, down here at the bottom. This is good because it helps the analyst understand what occurred and in what sequence. I can see the impacted users and impacted devices. If I wanted to drill into the evidence that's been collected, this is done through the investigation process. You can see that here. So very similar to what we did in the EDR. Now, if we go over to the right, we can see there's some other incidents that are occurring in our environment that could possibly be associated. So those also show up and you can link them together, by the way, if you wanted to, if you wanted to collapse that into one incident. So if we drill into uh, the actual alerts themselves, We've already looked at EDR, so let's filter out EDR. Let's only look at uh, Defender for Identity. Uh, and I think I picked Office 365, and that was more of a screw up than anything else. So these are all Defender for Identity. And you'll notice that we've got some reconnaissance alerts, and then we've got a remote code execution attempt on the domain controller. So when we drill into this. This is what the alert looks like inside of Defender for Identity. And you can see this was an LDAP query, so it's giving you the information back on that query. It gives you some of that MITRE data, et cetera. So we can go and we can look uh, at the different devices. We can look at the users involved. And you'll notice if I select that particular user, 
it's going to take me and give me uh, take me over to the cloud app security defender for identity portal and it's going to give me some information about that particular user so again it allows me to pivot based on whatever pillar i want to investigate so there's our uh, automated investigations that occurred across both identity and endpoint if I wanted to manage this incident, by the way, if I close or manage the incident here, it closes it across the platform, so I don't have to do it in two places. Eventually, this is where you're going to go, and honestly, this is where you should be working from today because this is becoming our primary portal. So we're looking at the device. So let's see if we can stop this attack on this device. Now, one thing that we could do is we could isolate the device. So isolating the device is only going to allow it to communicate to Defender, and if I want, uh, use the communications tools, but I'm not going to be that brutal. I'm just going to try to stop the implant on the machine. So what I've done is I've done a live response into the machine. So I'm shelled into the machine. Bad guy can't see me because I'm running in the context of Defender. I can get the connections on the machine. So there's our connections. And if I want to get a better view of this and maybe do some searching through it, I can jump over to the command log. I can pull that out into the browser. I can search through it. And I know which IP I'm talking to, so I'm kind of faking it a little bit here. You can see there's 10.0.1.5. That's my implant using PowerShell. So I see the process is 14300. So let's go get some more information about that process. So we're going to go back down. Oh, by the way, let's jump over here to Covenant and we can see that there's my implant still running, that client 01 implant. So now we're going to get information back on the process. So we'll see the process is running on the machine. We can do the same thing over here. I thought I cut that out. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, so here's the did a little movie magic. Uh, here's the uh, where I'm looking for that PowerShell instance. You can see all the PowerShell instances on the machine. There's 14300. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. So there's a um, ability in here to look up information about the process. So I'm real quickly, I'm just going to pull up the information about that particular process. And I was going to do PowerShell. I don't know why I was type and get there but anyway so now I pull back that particular process and I can scroll up and get all kinds of good information about what code was running on this system and I'll actually see the obfuscated code up here if I go up a little higher there you go there there's the actual implant that I, that I pushed onto the machine and I pushed that remotely by the way so so it actually saw that let's get rid of it so we're going to remediate 14300 so it quarantined that process so basically it killed that process let's go back over to covenant let me refresh the screen oh no more beacon no more implant so that's how you can use these tools together to actually remediate across uh, that kill chain. I think we're we're right up on time. So let me, um, more to follow on a future webcast, we'll talk about how you prevent phishing attacks using Defender. I just ran out of time, as you can see, to, to do that. Um, we don't have time for bonus detections. I will tell you that these systems were in Azure and it was detecting while I was doing these attacks. And there are some references to what I used. And I think we have about two minutes left. And if we have any any questions or commentary from the crowd. Yeah, Tony, I, I actually have one question here that I answered in the chat, but I'd also like to get your take. Uh, so someone posted, uh, deploying attack surface reduction uh, takes quite a bit of effort for us to validate and deploy. Can you advise which rules appear to be the most valuable against the current ransomware attacks targeting healthcare? What are Ooh. your thoughts? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, here, let me let me go back to that. <laughs> you know, honestly, you're like, well, all of them. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, hold on, let me pull this up. 
on the screen. Yeah. There so, we go. So, so I took it through the lens of, uh, you know, least impactful, the things that you could turn on just without having to do too much heavy lifting. Obviously, you're going to want to test, but, uh, you know, that's the way that I kind of approached it. But again, what do, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think some of them are pretty obvious, right? Like there's this one for ransomware that's going to look for particular techniques. Uh, a lot of this ransomware is lateral movement based. So anything that you can do to defeat their ability to do credential dumping could be could be helpful. Um, the I really like these block the office applications and the mm -hmm. the webmail from running executable content because that's how they're landing this uh, on your systems. Um, there, there's not really a lot of fluff in these. And I understand the overhead of, of of running these. Like, do I need to run this one from USB? Yeah, probably not because most of the, we're not seeing a ton of attacks that way unless you are. Um, you know, probably not that one, maybe so much. Adobe Reader shouldn't be creating anything. So, <laughs> you know, that was one. Um, block yeah. persistence through WMI event subscription, maybe on servers. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think there's really a great way to do that. You kind of have to do a risk assessment. I will tell you that other than the the demo that I used our demo content to trigger ASR, every other time I tried to trigger ASR, it actually got blocked by Defender yeah. AV. So it's it's like these are all really great, but they're kind of the second line of defense. Like you, you, most of the time, you're going to see Defender AV and AMSI catch it before these kick in. So these are there in case it's I hate to use the term zero day because it's overused but let's say it's something we've never seen before, then these ASR rules can potentially stop that. I, I don't right. think I answered your question, but that's about as good as I come up with. Yeah, I, I, the way I put it was testing, right? I mean, there's, there's not really uh, the perfect one to enable, but uh, all of them, except you are going to want to put them through, you know, especially around your critical apps, right? Especially in healthcare, when we're talking about, you know, different types of machines with different profiles that might be doing, you know, sensitive activities. In those cases, you know, you, you really do need to make sure that you don't have that app that is doing some sort of weird WMI call to, you know, fork off a process, right? right. Um, it happens. Right, uh, it does. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, um, yeah it's it. And that's you put them in audit mode, though. That's the the big yes. thing, right? Like, go ahead and deploy them in audit mode. I mean, that that should not have any impact on your environment. And then you can start looking at what gets surfaced back up, and that'll tell you if if you've got legit applications that would be disrupted. Yeah. Um. I was going to say, if you don't have Defender for Endpoint to surface up that data, you're just going to have to go in the event log and pull it back to a SIM tool. And that's all documented on how to do that. Yeah, that's one of the things that's a little bit oddly documented is actually the licensing requirements around like ASR and a lot of these protections in the Defender stack is a lot of them are actually available at the E3 level. Um, it's just uh, like Tony said there, you have to go about collecting the events yourselves because obviously they're not going to show up in the EDR. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Yes, uh, this is definitely recorded and definitely will be available. Oh, Mike answered. Awesome. Well, if there's no final questions, I guess, and and you can contact us via the the blog. And uh, if you have questions, or reach out to me on LinkedIn uh, or Scott on LinkedIn, and ask ask questions and keep the discussion going. Absolutely, love it. This is one of my favorite topics. Yeah, yeah, a lot of fun. Cool, cool. Well, with that, thanks everybody. Um, and yeah, just reach out if you need anything else. Appreciate it. <laughs>